So good afternoon and welcome to RSSL's webinar related to the considerations that supply chains need to consider um, related to allergen management um, as a consequence of the coronavirus pandemic or even pandemic. I hope you're all staying safe and well during the pandemic situation we all find ourselves in. Barbara Hurst and Jessica Sage will be delivering the technical aspects of the webinar this afternoon and I will be here to support them. So my name is Jane Staniforth and I'm the Head of Food Sales here within our commercial team. Jessica and Barbara are our food safety consultants within the business, both specialising in allergen management within the manufacturing environment. So before we get started, let's just share with you some information in case you are having any technical issues and also wish to pose a question as the team are presenting. So for any technical issues that you are having, please send a short message within the question chat box on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, the team here will then respond to you directly in order to try and resolve your issues. And whilst Barbara and Jess are presenting, if you have any questions you wish to ask, please feel free to submit these using the questions box on the right hand side of your screen. We will then do our best to answer questions at the end of the formal presentation. Of course, if you have a confidential question, please email me and we'll come back to you independently. Okay, so now all the admin has been sorted. Let's proceed with the webinar. And let me start by telling you a little bit more about RSSL. So you can then understand why we're able to share our knowledge with you today. So RSL has supported the global food industry with a broad range of services since 1987. And we continue to do this even during the COVID-19 situation. Our working practices have adapted, but our scientists continue to be on site completing projects for our clients. And so Barbara and Jess are both great examples of adapting to support our clients in that they used to spend most of their time in client factories. But as less clients currently want external consultants on site, they're now supporting our clients remotely with a range of services, including training courses delivered remotely, consultancy support delivered by video call and desktop documentation reviews. And I'll speak a little bit more about these services at the end of the webinar. So we work for many of the top global companies through to a number of small startups providing a range of services. And these services are split into um, services to support recent research and development programs through to food safety and quality services. So this slide covers all the services we provide um, supporting the industry regarding allergen management, both from a consultancy perspective through to ingredient and through to sort of the ingredient and product testing that is undertaken. And as you can see, this is an area where we provide a lot of support in many different ways to the food industry. So I'll now hand over to Barbara and Jessica to present the technical content of this webinar and tell us more about the supply chain considerations related to allergen management as a consequence of coronavirus. And we'll then do our best to answer any questions that you've asked at the end. So firstly, over to Barbara. Thanks, Jane. I hope you can all hear me. So the next section of this webinar, we're going to cover some of the supply chain challenges that we find ourselves in in these current times. So we are living through a pandemic and I think, you know, with the best will in the world, not many people would have been able to predict that this was going to happen and think about the impact it might have had upon our supply chain. But there are risks, certainly, from our current supply chain. And it might be that your current supplier that you're using has had to actually stop production in what it was they were making. They might have a reduced level of production. They could be managing a high level of sickness or isolation or something I think that's really hard to predict. They might even be trying to manage things like border closures. So they might be able to make stuff but can't get it to you. In terms of thinking, well, what can be done really to anticipate any of these changes. There are some things I think you can do, and it's really about trying to monitor the situation with commodities, particularly in the country of origin, having those really good relationships with your current suppliers. Now is the time to really be looking out for them and working with them. You can do the broader thing to look really, look at monitor commodity prices around the world, because clearly when you start to see rises, then you might have stress coming into the system. 
clearly part of the proactive approach is all around the kind of the VASIP and the TASIP type things that you will have done already been done. But I think it's not necessarily reasonable that everybody could have predicted a pandemic quite on the scale that we're living through now. And I guess the other thing really to think about is mostly what we're going to be doing looking at supply chain is going to be a remote exercise right now. So let's think about how to assess really what is at risk. And this is a very simple question on one level is thinking about, are you getting what you paid for? Now, when we first of all think about authenticity and authenticity, that word could mean all sorts of things. So is it authentic? Clearly, it can go from one end of the scale, scale where it might be fraudulent, in other words, an intentional um, deception for financial gain, but also it can cover things like adulteration, substitution, dilution of whatever material it is you're looking for. These are likely to have legislation consequences. They might have quality consequences. They may have some food safety issues, but they'll certainly have financial consequences. When we think about if you're making a claim on a finished product, think about whether you're making a free from allergen claim. Clearly, if you are and there are issues with certain commodities or materials that you're buying in being at risk, then this will be 100 percent focused on food safety. When we think about vegan and vegetarian, of course, which there's been a huge um, rise in in the last um, few years, Clearly, vegan and vegetarian is a lifestyle choice, but you also have to consider that there is a risk potentially that either a milk or egg allergic consumer assumes vegan is safe. So again, if you're making claim on finished pack, you need to think about the food safety risk of that as well. When we think about country of origin, that's clearly going to just be a legal implication. So in the current times in which we live, it might be that actually you need to do some level of testing before those materials arrive on site to give yourself some level of assurance. You may be doing much more inspection with material arriving and you might be doing some testing on arrival. And my colleague Jess is going to be talking about testing later on, so I'm certainly not going to talk about that now. Clearly, with all of this, food safety claims and the risk of these are the most important that you are going to the need to be able to substantiate. So we are going to be focusing on them for the rest of the webinar. So let's think about assessing the risk really for allergens. When we think on the risk hierarchy, the wrong information on the packet is the absolute highest level of risk in terms of the risk to the consumer, because if the information on the packet is wrong, that will be maintained for as long as that product is produced, so its entire life cycle. So if the incorrect information is collected from a supplier, the risk is that the labelling will be wrong. Thinking about if you've got suppliers change their information based on the current pandemic or you're having to buy from a different supplier, you may well have to be reassessing that information that's coming to you. And that reason for that change can be for a variety of reasons. So you'll need to reassess that risk very carefully. Of course, if you're having to make changes to the information, then letting the consumers know what those changes are is really critical. And we know that consumers can get quite complacent. They don't always read the labels each time. And there is one other thing to consider here, of course. In these current times, you know, food shopping at the moment is not a social activity and consumers are encouraged not to browse or pick up products unless they're going to buy them. So if you're having to make changes to information, just make an extra consideration there that it needs to be very easy to access and very clear for a consumer to be able to read it. Clearly, as we know, with any kind of changes to labelling, then that's an important risk that you'll need to consider within a manufacturing setting. We know certainly that mistakes with label changes are a risk and they must be identified as such. Any controls that are put in place to manage it must be demonstrated to be effective through a robust system of validation. So when we think about the first set of allergens, really, we think about intentional allergens. So those materials that we have knowingly added into a product intentionally and therefore clearly there's a legal obligation to have those present correctly identified and labelled and emphasised in the ingredients list. So regulatory impact there, of course, there is. Some, of course, we know are exempted. 
What we do know still is that mistakes in this area still account for a high proportion of the recalls and incidents. Now, a large part of this exercise, of course, is based upon collecting the correct information from the suppliers. And as we stated just previously before, mistakes in this are at a very high risk to consumers. We do know, however, one good thing is that consumers who have specific allergies won't purchase and consume products where allergens are present as deliberate ingredients. So we do need to consider that if errors are made in this area, this will put allergic consumers at risk if the information is wrong. So that's intentional allergens. Now we think about unintentional. This is the area that's much harder to consider. This is where allergens may be present unintentionally. And then you, as manufacturers or food service, then have that choice to decide whether to have a warning cons to consumers so that they can avoid choosing that product and eating it. And that's usually in the form of may contain or precautionary allergen labeling. So collecting this information and assessing that level of risk is always much harder than the intentional allergens. This has always been a real challenge. You know, the pandemic has merely just made it probably even harder. So the extra challenges that you might be facing now is you may be buying from new suppliers that you maybe don't have the relationships with that you might have had with current suppliers. You maybe can't buy from suppliers directly, so you're forced into having to use agents and brokers, and that can add to a layer, layer of risk because traceability might be even harder. Of course, physical auditing, as Jane was saying, is almost impossible at the moment, and hopefully we'll get back to some level of normality, but not probably any time very soon. And of course, you might not have that foundation of a good trusted relationship where they can advise you of anything or any changes in advance of them actually happening. So you're in that position now where you're having to assess the risk remotely, and we have to accept that in the current situation, this is just more likely. So they may be new suppliers, as we say. It's really all about asking the right questions so that the suppliers understand what they're being asked, that they give you the right information back in a clear, concise and accurate way, that you then understand how to interpret those answers. Um, so we're going to spend a little bit of time now thinking about what all the different routes of contamination might be. So there are three common ways really that unintentional allergen or for that matter, any other contaminants that we spoke of before could get into your material. So the first one, it might be coming from a material supplied into your supplier. We're gonna focus on each one of these a little bit in just a moment. It might be that they have unintentional allergen presence within that supplier's facility. So either through shared areas, shared equipment, shared line. Or the third area to consider is where there might be agricultural co-mingling of unintentional allergens. And we're going to take each one of these in turn now. So the first one, it might be a may contain coming from their supplier. This first route, I would say, is probably the hardest one to assess, but it's also probably the lowest overall risk, because if it's coming as a may contain, from an ingredient into your supplier that is then supplying to you, hopefully it's present at a fairly low level in the finished product. <clears throat> so if your supplier is receiving material into them with a may contain something, you your job really is then to assess whether or not that may contain will impact the material that's subsequently supplied to you. And you have to decide if that's at a sufficiently high level that you will need to carry that warning onto your product. As I stated at the beginning, really, the risk here is likely to be fairly low. But if the unintentional allergen level is high or the supplied material makes up a high proportion of the finished product, that might not be the case. So your job really is to try and ask those right questions to try and work out if you can, through the information that you get from your supplier, where that risk might be coming from. So is it from agricultural co-mingling? Is it coming from their supplier's manufacturing facility or even a step further back from their supplier? And I guess it's really worth just stating here that it's sometimes very hard to get a supplier to declare absolutely no risk, which is really what you want to do and gives you the sure and a fired way to say that you don't need to carry that may contain onto your material. 
Okay, let's take the next level. So imagine that unintentional allergen is coming from within the manufacturing facility. So when we consider the levels of risk here, the highest risk is probably when it's made on the same line as something else. But if there is cleaning happening between the product that contains the allergen and the product that doesn't, that's then being supplied to you, you'll need to think about what kind of cleaning is being done. How are they doing it? Now, Jess is going to take you through some of the considerations for cleaning validation later, so I'm not going to dwell on it too much. But you need to ask the questions and thinking about the risk from the different types of clean, from a full strip wet clean with detergent, might be the easiest and the best way of removing allergen, through to a dry brush for gross debris removal. Or maybe think about if it is dry cleaning, there could be a big difference between vacuuming or air hoses. Air hoses, of course, might then spread the contamination even more. You might be in a situation where they're using a CIP system or maybe purge flushing. If it's coming from some shared equipment, this will depend on what it is and how, if it is indeed cleaned. So some of the considerations I've just mentioned before. The lowest level of risk is likely to come from when it's within the same production area, but in fact, there's no shared equipment. This could be from a shared storage area or shared weighing area, or maybe even just transporting around the facility. You'll need to ask those questions to try and understand how that contamination will actually happen. Is it moving through the air? Is it moving via people? And most importantly, how is that risk being controlled and have those controls been validated? So you need to be thinking about what's the risk, how is it going to cause contamination and what controls are in place to manage that and how have those controls been validated to prove that they are effective. When we think about agricultural co-mingling, there can be all sorts of areas where this can come from. And this area actually can be very hard to quantify. And it's hard often sometimes to be consistent when you consider things like seasonal variability. So in this, this case, this is where sampling is really almost as important as the testing. And you always need to base everything on the worst case scenario. So it's possible that contamination actually may be inevitable, but actually the controls in place might be very effective at removing it. We can talk through some examples there of where we think about processing. So it might be that they've got some kind of system of either sorting, sieving or washing that actually can be a very effective means at removing the contaminant that you don't want there. So again, much as we've mentioned many times over, it's really about understanding the risk as best you can, asking the right questions and then working out how they are managing to control that risk, so hopefully to reduce it down to a negligible level. So just to summarise here, the decisions that you're going to have to make, it, it may be that you don't always have all the information that you would like, but you're still going to have to assess that risk and make some kind of decision. The ideal scenario is that you've got evidence of what those levels of carryover might be, in a certificate of analysis, but we all appreciate that that might not be possible. So therefore you have much more of a reliance potentially now to do some of your own verification testing. But really you're gonna need a minimum level of confidence at least from any new supplier. And we understand these scenarios were always there, but that they are especially challenging in the current times. So I'm now gonna hand over to my colleague, Jess. Wonderful, thank you very much, Barbara. Okay, so as Barbara's mentioned, we're now gonna move on to consider testing. Um, and as Barbara's mentioned, it might be that you're in a position where you're needing to assess new suppliers and analytical testing might be one of the tools that you use to do that. Or it might just be that you are reviewing analytical data that has been provided by your supplier. But either way, there will be some important points that you need to be aware of when you're doing this. Okay, so if you are considering commissioning a level of testing or asking that your supplier does some themselves, the amount and type of testing should be driven by the type of material that's being supplied. And hopefully some kind of assessment will have been performed to determine what level of testing and what type of testing is appropriate. As examples, if the material being supplied should be a free from material, so free, free of a specific allergen, 
then you would expect the supplier to be able to provide some evidence to substantiate that claim. Or it might be that you consider doing a level of testing yourself. If the supplied material has a may contain warning for an allergen or allergens, again, they should be able to provide evidence that this is the case, ideally in the form of testing results, and they should be able to detail how that contamination is occurring. And this should really be linked to their allergen risk assessment. We understand that this is very much the ideal scenario and obtaining this information may not be easy. So it might be that to assess whether a may contain warning from a supplier should be carry, carried forward, you may need to do some testing yourself. If the material being supplied has known cross-contamination issues, and the example we have here is soy contamination in wheat, then your supplier should also be aware of these issues and be undertaking their own assessments to determine the levels present um, and also whether these levels vary seasonally. If your supplier is stating that no testing is needed, then they should be able to provide you with evidence that they have effective allergen management controls in place. And this again should be linked with their allergen risk assessment. Okay, so moving on to think about what, what good testing looks like. Uh, so if you are thinking about doing some testing, what should you be doing? Very simply, if you are looking for allergens, then where possible, you should be using ELISA testing. It looks for protein, which makes it clinically relevant, as it's the protein that causes people to have allergic reactions, and it's also likely to give you quantitative results. You may be in a situation, though, where there is no ELISA test available for the allergen that you're looking for, in which case you may need to be using PCR testing. So PCR testing is looking for DNA rather than protein, and it will give you qualitative results to indicate presence or absence um, of, of the DNA. Although this testing is not looking for the presence of protein, so it's not looking for the presence of the allergen necessarily, PCR can still be used as an indication of the presence of that allergen because, because of the fact that DNA doesn't exist on its own. So if it's present, then there is likely to be other material associated with it, which could be the protein. PCR testing will be appropriate, appropriate sorry, if you are concerned about authenticity of certain materials, uh, meat and fish being examples, as you can use PCR to look for other species that should not be present. Although if you're going down this route, you will likely need to know which species are likely to be present as these tests are targeted methods. Also, if you're buying materials or products that need to be vegan or vegetarian, again, you might need to use PCR testing to look for the presence of specific animal species or potentially a generic screen such as a vertebrate test, which would look for DNA from any animal with a backbone. RSSL has recently launched a vertebrate test, which can be used as a screening test when contamination could be coming from multiple species. If milk or egg are your contaminants, however, then the specific ELISA tests for these should be used. Okay, so whichever method you're using, you should be checking that it has been validated for use with your sample type and for the validated to detect the contaminant of concern. Ideally, you and your supplier should be working with the laboratories that have accreditation and the methods themselves should also be accredited. The laboratory should be doing ongoing validation of their methods to ensure that they are fit for purpose. Uh, we know that some sample types are very difficult to analyze and can cause issues, but occasionally we can also be taken by surprise, uh, meaning that the validation uh, on an ongoing basis is really the only way to be confident that the test is working as it should. Examples of validation include spike recovery testing, which should be done particularly with ELISA testing for any sample type that has not been tested before uh, to check that the test can find the contaminant if it is there. Checking for cross-reactivity issues should be an ongoing process and again the laboratory should be keeping track of, of these. Testing of positive controls will ensure that you can be confident that the test can detect the contaminant to start with. Clearly if it can't find it when it's supposed to be present then it won't be likely to find it when it isn't. Also be aware that some tests will only work if the contaminant is raw or in uncooked form. Again, a good lab will be checking this if they know that this is an issue affecting their test method. 
Okay, so when it comes to deciding what testing to do or assessing whether the right testing has been done, there are often some challenges and these are some of the examples where we often see confusion and uh, mistakes being made. So uh, thinking about milk testing, when milk is the contaminant of concern, there are different tests available uh, to use. And the one that is used should be driven by what the source of the milk is. If you're not sure which test is most appropriate for your situation, then the laboratory should be able to advise you. A brief kind of summary um, really is that if the source of the contamination is whole milk, then you should be using a casein ELISA test. If whey is of concern, then use a beta-lactoglobulin or BLG ELISA test. Or if the contaminant is likely to be lactose on its own, then use a lactose-specific test. Levels of gluten are not equivalent to levels of cereal, as gluten only makes up part of the total amount of cereal protein. There are unfortunately not ELISA tests available currently for each of the specific cereals, and so gluten can be used as a marker for the presence of the cereals, but the conversion would need to be done by the laboratory to understand the levels of the actual cereal that might be present. And also when you're thinking about gluten, remember that the 20 parts per million level only applies if you're looking to make a gluten-free claim. Again, that's another area where we see quite a lot of confusion. If a supplier insists that there is no concern about an allergen because they have cooked it, boiled it, or fried it, or you know, processed it um, using heat in some way, um, then really this is not sufficient. Unfortunately for us, allergens are not that easy to destroy. You might change their shape and make them harder to detect using testing, but it does not mean that they won't cause a reaction in an allergic individual. All mustard ELISA kits currently available on the market cross-react with rapeseed and other seeds. Therefore, it should not be used um, if, you, if you know that these are potential ingredients present uh, in your products. So if you are going down the route of using mustard ELISA testing, do this with caution. Um, we actually use PCR testing at RSSL to look for mustard for this very reason. As I've already mentioned, there may be situations where PCR testing is your only option, such as in the case uh, of celery testing uh, or potentially mustard if you're handling rapeseed and other seed. In these situations, you will have to work with qualitative results that cannot give you an indication of levels. But as I've already mentioned, these results can still be useful to you, provided that all the right validation work has been done. Substantiating vegan claims can be challenging, partly due to the fact that there are not tests available for all the materials that can be classed as non-vegan, one example being uh, testing for the presence of honey. There is also no way of being able to test for the ethical aspects behind a vegan claim, and so this will have to be assessed based on risk assessment and understanding of your supply chain. I've talked about how you might be able to use screening tests to, to look for multiple contaminant species at once. The example that we have at RSSL being the vertebrate test. However, this will be less effective if your contaminants are likely to be egg or milk due to the fact that these contain relatively low levels of DNA. For that reason, using the specific ELISA test would be recommended. Okay, so moving on to think about cleaning validation now. So it might be that your supplier is telling, telling you that one of the controls they're using to manage the risk of cross-contamination on site is cleaning. And ideally, you'll be able to review some information relating to how that cleaning has been done and how it has been validated. Key things to look out for if you are in this position are that they should have done a positive control test to make sure that the allergen can be picked up to begin with and that it's there at a relatively high level. Uh, the clean samples that they have tested should be in line with the type of cleaning that they've done. So this might be surface swabs, uh, it might be rinse waters if they're using a CIP system. Uh, it might be the flush material if they're, they're using a flushing uh, system to do the cleaning. Then they should be testing the next made product on that line or using that piece of equipment to check for any carryover of the allergen. Industry best practice is that they should have repeated this exercise three times. It might be that the supplier has validated their cleaning but not using the material or product that they are supplying to you as the next made or next run material. As long as there is evidence that they have based what they have done on their worst case scenario, using the hardest to clean material with a high protein content, then really this should still be good enough. Okay, so some watch outs here. 
for if you're reviewing whether a cleaning validation has been done well. Again, when thinking about allergens, ideally the testing that has been done should be ELISA where it is available. If PCR is the only option, then the recommendation is that you try to get additional information if you can about how the cleaning is done and what levels the contaminant is present at in the previously run product or material. If you have visibility of their allergen risk assessment as well, this can help you gauge whether they are managing allergens effectively. Another watch out is if the supplier is stating that they've done their validation using rapid test kits only. These tests are not quantitative and are generally not as robust as laboratory based methods. Their extraction procedures tend to be quick and basic and for that reason they are not ideal for use on finished products and ingredients as they are not as effective at extracting all the protein from a complex matrix like food. If they are used on finished products or ingredients, a lot of validation work is required to demonstrate that they can give accurate results. Essentially, they are very simple tests and suited best to simple sample matrices, such as clean surfaces, where there is not likely to be much other material present to interfere with detecting the allergen. They are really only suitable for verification purposes, where they can be used as an indication of whether a line or a piece of equipment has been cleaned to the right standard. They should not be used for validation. Okay, so in summary then, if you or your supplier is commissioning analytical testing, the amount and frequency should be driven by the material that is being supplied and whether there are any claims being made on it and the risks of contamination that have been identified. Ideally, ELISA testing should be used for allergen detection, but you may be in situations where PCR testing is the only option. And this is likely what you will be using for meat and fish authenticity or for vegan and vegetarian claims. It is really important that whatever test is being used, it has been validated to demonstrate that it's fit for purpose and will work with your sample type and your contaminant. Be aware of the limitations of the testing and what it can and can't tell you. And if you need help with interpreting the results, then you should be able to reach out to the laboratory that's done the work. It is vitally important that a cleaning validation study includes all the right types of samples, including positive controls and next offline products. And lastly, watch out for the use of rapid tests. Um, if they're being used for validation. They're really not designed for that purpose. They're really only suitable as verification tools. For a validation study, laboratory-based methods should be used. Okay, that's it from me for now. Back to Jane. Okay, so thank you, Jessica and Barbara, for that in-depth overview. And as you can see, we all know that COVID-19 is impacting supply chains and the assessment of new suppliers is more of a challenge currently. So understanding how and where um, your allergen cross-contamination could occur will help you all guide your decision-making. So analytical testing can be used as a tool to aid this assessment, but it is important that tests are validated to show that they are fit for purpose. So thank you to all those attendees who have asked some questions and we'll start to now work through those questions. So the first question is for you, Jessica. So you mentioned the vertebrate test a couple of times. So when would you recommend using it? That is a very good question, Jane, thank you. Um, okay, so as I said before, so the vertebrate test, it's looking for the presence of DNA, essentially from any animal with a backbone. So it can be a great way to screen if you have a potential for multiple uh, species to be present as contaminants. Um, so yeah, it, it can be a really good screening tool if it might be that you're in a situation uh, where you don't know what the potential contaminant species might be. Um, and in this case, the test can be used to provide supporting evidence that there are no contaminating species present, present, but we would recommend that you speak to the laboratory that's doing the testing to just confirm with them that they agree that this is a suitable um, route for you to take to do your testing. Um, ideally, you will be able to ascertain from your supply chain what the likely contaminant species are because really that's that's the best way to do it it might be again as i said if milk and egg are your likely contaminants then we would always say the elisa testing should be used instead 
Okay, thank you, Jessica. So next question, Barbara, I think is probably better for you. So do you expect the risks to the supply chain from the pandemic to be over soon? I wish, but I expect unfortunately not. So as we're saying, um, some countries are at the early stages of the pandemic. Others like us kind of seem to be coming into some kind of a recovery state. Um, but then we're also seeing new outbreaks. So I think realistically, we, we all realise that this is going to continue for some time. And I guess really the knock on to the supply chain may also last even longer than the pandemic itself, because the supply could be disrupted and there could be some kind of a lag effect going on. Plus, also, I guess the other thing to consider is if the supply chain is disrupted, then the pressure on supply and the impact on cost will also probably be longer lasting. So I'm sorry, not, not any great news there, I don't think. I hope I'm wrong. So do I. OK, next question. Uh, maybe for you, Jess. Um, I've been sent the results from a cleaning validation study in an Excel spreadsheet. Is that OK? Uh, OK, yeah, another good question, actually. So um, this is actually something we see fairly often. Um, it might be that you're in a situation where, yeah, your supplier isn't sending you through all the certificates of analysis. They are sending you more of a kind of summary of everything they've done and it might be in something like a spreadsheet. Um, ideally, you want to be able to see the certificates of analysis themselves. Um, but, you know, like I said, it might be for any number of reasons the supplier has decided just to collate everything into one place. It might be they've taken a huge number of swabs, as an example, and they don't necessarily want to be bombarding you with all of those certificates. Um, so putting it into something like a spreadsheet might be easier. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing if they do this, but if you are having to review it in this kind of form, what we would say is make sure you're looking out for all the key information and make sure it's all there. So things like they should be detailing the testing method that's been used, what accreditation that testing method has, the LOD, sorry, limit of detection or limit of quantification of the method that's been used, and sense check that the units uh, look right. So if you're thinking about swab results, it should really be micrograms per swab. You don't want to be seeing uh, PPM or micrograms per kilogram results for swabs. Um, so yeah, so really, um, like I said, it's not necessarily a disaster if they're not sending you through the certificates um, and if you're trying to review it in some other format. But just make sure that it looks like all the right information is there. And if it is, then I think you can be fairly confident that, that they've done enough. OK, thank you, Jess. Uh, next question, maybe one for you, Barbara. Um, somebody's asking, can you help with our supplier assessment process? Thanks, Jane. Yes, yes, indeed we can. So we've got quite a lot of experience at helping different companies um, with supplier assessment processes. So it might be that they want just a bit of refinement. They maybe want some just kind of independent view of it. Um, or it might be that they want some support right from a standing start. They might need training maybe to their supplier quality team. So I guess the ask here is if you've got some questions, please get in touch if you're interested and we'll see what we can do to help you out. OK, thank you, Barbara. OK, so that's all the questions we have for now in the time that we've got allowed. So um, we've come to the end of the webinar and I hope that you found it useful and we appreciate the questions that you've asked. As we haven't managed to get to all the questions in the time that we have today, we will respond to you separately outside of the webinar with the answers to the other questions. And as I've already mentioned, as has Barbara and Jess, that they would usually be out and about at client sites providing support and training in person. But given the current situation, they've had to adapt how they provide their services. So if you do need support, they can deliver training remotely in different areas, including allergen management and cleaning validation. And they can also still support with allergen focused site assessments through the review of documentation, as well as using video conferencing. And as, have we, and as we have just been discussing, um, review of supplier information is particularly critical at the moment. And they can support with this, as well as with the review of policies and other documentation. So if you do need any additional support and help, then please do get in touch with us. 
I would just like to draw your attention to another webinar we're running in on the 9th of July related to innovation and immunity claims and hope you'll be able to join us then. We'll send some more information out about this in due course. So on behalf of the RSL team, I'd like to thank you for listening today and please do not hesitate to contact us if you have any questions or you need our support with projects, either both from a testing or a consultancy perspective. We will send out a copy of the slides to you following the session. And once the coronavirus situation has improved, we look forward to meeting you at future events and hope that we'll be able to meet face to face. But in the meantime, thank you for your time. Hope you all have a good rest of the day and enjoy the sun. And please do stay safe in these challenging times. Thank you. Bye.